Hi, my name is Benedict for Hire Hertz. This is a training video far more than a particular review. Matter of fact, I'm not looking at gear at all here. We're looking at the concept of levels, how we measure levels, how we use them, and how they get abused, uh, and we get ourselves lost. And uh, so the idea here is to help you to understand what levels are, how we measure them, why we measure them, and how we should be paying attention to those measurements of level, and also how we should not be paying attention to those measurements of level. We're also trying something a little different here in that there is a companion article tripod by my good and wonderful self. Uh, the companion article and this video, while covering the same material, will not be the same, exactly the same as each other. So the encouragement very much is to take in both. So read first if you're more of a reader type, uh, watch first if you are more of a watcher type, uh, and then do the opposite. Because by that repetition and also by my potentially coming at things from a slightly different angle, or just saying them again, it's just a repetition thing, then you might start to take this in. This is subtle stuff. And the reason that a lot of people go astray with levels and get caught is because they make the fundamental error of not understanding what these things are and why they work the way they do, because they work strangely. So the very first question is, what are levels. Before we answer that, we need to understand. A lot of times, or well, most people just, just talk about the volume. Oh, the volume was so loud, man. Okay. What does that tell us? Not that they're stupid. What that tells us is that level is a perceptual thing. We actually have no concept of level at all. We are unable to say with any kind of accuracy, what level something is. As humans, we have no, no ability. We are not born with a multimeter or a meter in, inside ourselves. We have emotive reactions to things. So the example that I use in the written article is of uh, a cat that uh, people, two people give their answers on this event where there is a cat. And the first person uh, picks the cat as, uh, I think it was white, and, and says that it was softly mewling, emotive language. The second person says, oh, the cat was purple, and, and it was yowling something horrendous. Again, notice that was emotive. While they give the impression of level, the amount of volume, how loud this was, what they're really giving us is their emotional reaction, their emotional interaction to that event. If we could have some kind of computer machine, there is no such thing as AI, so let's not go down that road, observe that event, it would be dispassionate because it has no feelings about cats one way or another. Therefore, it would merely observe and it would see a cat. It would see tortoise shell, it would see part tabby, and it would note that the cat was articulating, as in bleh, making some kind of sound. And it could reasonably perhaps guess that it was doing that in a communicative sort of a way. And it could report that it articulated in level range from, I think, minus 24 dB to minus 18 dB. It can give us facts. But notice how dispassionate that is compared to the emotive points of view. Now, volume is our emotive reaction to it. Levels are the actual factual, what the machine is reading. Now, the machines are designed to be able to read in two fundamental ways. We'll get to them later. Now, to better understand this concept and to separate ourselves to as much as possible from the concept that everything is literal, because nothing in recorded music is literal. Everything is illusion. Let's have a look at some pictures. In this picture, we have two people. Are these two people the same size? Well, chances are your first reaction is, no, dude, they're not the same size. Clearly, that one is very small. Righto, fair enough. 
That's logical enough. However, what if I now give you this extra information? You're probably going to be starting to think of changing your answer if you weren't already considering that as a possibility in the first place. We can now see that big guy standing close, little guy standing a long way away. Watch the size of my hand. Goes from like fully large dude to, oh my God, that poor guy's got a micro hand. Perspective. Once we add the information to confirm that we have perspective, you see how we change the facts in the situation. So it's all about perception. Now that was a lot of fun. Let's do another one. This one is even trickier. We have the same two people. Are those two people the same size? The other question is, are they standing beside each other or is one in front of the other? You're gonna have answers. You may feel a little confused about it even. But let me tell you, in terms of where they're actually at in a 3D space, they're both exactly the same size and they are both on the same, shall we say, level with regards to front back. However, by using the physical illusion of perspective, by having this guy stand up a little bit, he appears to be behind. But because he's standing above the other fellow, we immediately take him to be bigger. Also, because he appears to be standing behind, because this guy is outside the frame, he's actually come outside the framework, which says, I'm leaping out. And because this guy has the illusion of perspective, and yet appears to be actually the same size, it tells us that seeing he should shrink, seeing he's going backwards, he must be much bigger. So we've created a kind of a circular illusion and we are using your mind, how you perceive and put things together to actually try to solve what's happening in this scene. Once you fully understand this, and this is a side step for a lot of people and quite confusing because they want to come at everything head on and then they wonder why they fail. You need to get this concept. Once you get it and you go, oh, I see, then you can begin to understand what levels are really showing you, how they're important and how they are not important, that they are merely a small factor. And this is how a real mix engineer works. There are plenty of mix engineers who just work head on. They just jam things together like this. And you hear them all over the place, these mixes that are like incredibly loud and incredibly wide, but they are flat as a biscuit and not a particularly nice biscuit, like one of those horrible rice cake things. <laughs> Why they couldn't put chocolate chips in them, I don't know. A good mix, mix engineer, remotely understanding mix engineer, knows how to do this. Just as I knew how to basically give you clues, cues, true and false, to have you come to certain conclusions with our pictures of two people. We measure levels and we use these doohickeys, which you can see here. We can see the um, LED type meters and these things we loosely call VU meters. The first thing we need to do is to look at what are these measurements. The most common one that you meet is called a decibel which is a small d and a big b. The notable thing about a decibel is it is one-tenth decky of a bell, bell. And that's pretty pointless. It does have point of view or some kind of um, audiology type person, but for us as, uh, as musicians, mix engineers, we don't care. I list that simply because some people get awfully, awfully upset if they don't get given facts. I'm not interested in facts, I'm interested in getting the job done. Decibels are merely the common unit of measure that we give, so these numbers tend to represent something like decibels. In this case, not, but we'll get there. The most common thing that we use is what's called a peak. Now, we shouldn't use this. This is the rookie error. We've got this little sand. It's peaking at 
say minus 12 dB. Let's now move that so that we're looking at VU. Hang on, that's peaking at minus 20. That's just, like, not cool, dude. Peaks are exactly what the machine is hearing. Now remember, as humans, we cannot tell. We actually work very slowly, which we'll get to in a moment. But when the machine listens, the machine can listen dispassionately, and that's telling us at that very moment in time how much signal we've got. And it's useful, but it's not the most useful. It's useful because it helps us to not hit the top of the can, which it goes clang, we don't want that. But it is not the most useful piece of information that we can get from meters. So if you're beginning, probably you're looking at peak or possibly peak program, which is the other one, to see how that holds a little bit longer. So the difference between peak and peak program, see how it doesn't quite make it to 12, is that it's averaged out. The most common average is about 10 milliseconds. So it's taking a window of time and saying within these 10 milliseconds, we heard this, which means that we heard a level here and we heard a level here, but we'll average it out over 10 milliseconds. It's not super used in music mixing. It's not to say people don't use them, but it's not. It's not particularly useful information seeing we have better measures, but if you encounter it, that's what it is. The numbers that you really want to get to are VU. That VU means volume unit, and so by rights, these numbers here, while expressed as dB, are actually volume units. And that's weird sideways stuff. All it is, it's a measure over averages. I did not dig into the math as to how it's done. Uh, math is of no interest to a mix engineer. Uh, knowing the basics of how the machine works, that's of interest, that's necessary, but we are not technicians, we are artists. Artists don't need to know the true chemistry and geology of what makes rocks go funny colors when you put water in them. They just need to know how those colors come together. They need to know that that process exists, but past that, they don't need the intricate details. So a VU averages over time, but the average is based upon how we perceive things. Remember, we can't hear anything, not really, not in the way you want to think. We perceive things and we have reactions to them. And so the volume unit was invented because they realized that this was the only way we could realistically use a physical measure that showed us how we felt about what was going on because they knew back then that music was not about technicalities, music's about how we feel about it. Therefore, giving us readings, which they actually couldn't do at the time, that were based on what there was irrelevant, was no interest to anybody at all, really, compared to how is my audience going to feel about this? Well, the most important factor in that is up here, and here. But if you want a meter to tell you whether you're about to explode their stereo or make them spit their soup all over the lounge room when the advert comes on and it's like um, as loud as a Boeing, when the rest of the program was like this, then a meter is helpful, really helpful. So the VU comes in, uh, you can go read about all the details of how it got there. It's interesting and you should read it, but it's not that exciting. Uh, not compared to other things. So we get this, which is telling us what we actually hearing. Benedict, that little blip is not very exciting. There's not much to it. It's not really moving my meters a lot. No, we can see that. That's what your VU is. Your VU is actually more important. If you have one measure tool in your, in your arsenal and no other, then a VU meter is actually far more important to you than any other. But just be aware that not all things that look like VU meters, look like we're getting different readings. This is reading at about minus 12. This is reading at about minus 20, where this one's reading. So while they look like what we refer to as VU meters, 
they're actually peak meters. They just look like VU meters. There are advantages to doing this, but... So the VU is a meter that has a fair stab at how we feel about what we are hearing. There is then RMS, root mean square. Oh my god, maths. Yeah, we're not going to get into that. RMS is quite similar to VU, broadly speaking. No, you don't need to write to tell me the difference. Anybody who's interested in that is going to be off at Wikipedia right now, reading all the joys of RMS and the differences with VU. Good on them, champions. Uh, broadly speaking, RMS and VU are used interchangeably, and at the level of being a musician and a, uh, and a, and, and a mix engineer, um, even a, a, a casual mastering engineer, you don't rightly need to know the difference or even care. The terms can be interchanged passably well. It just means an average over time. And that can be a bit flexible, but RMS and VU, good enough to say that they are sort of the same thing. The new one is LUFS. LUFS is an attempt to redo VU. Um, I know it's all the fashion. They've been built out of, well, really a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, but they're an attempt to solve the problem of um, mix and mastering engineers sending off stuff that's just too effing loud. So what happens is, as I said before, you're watching your TV show and it's at a reasonable volume, an advert comes along and you spit your soup all over the place. That is not good practice for anybody. I know those that say, oh, but I'll turn it up louder, then people really, you know, that's simply because they don't have any training, any clue as to what they're doing. They're idiots. They're working under some kind of silly sausage logic that, oh, if everything's like fully blam and loud dude all the time, then my thing has to be epic. You're a spank. It was a thing worth trying. If you read about um, Andrew Sheps and, um, and, and his reasoning behind Death Magnetic, the world's largest record, the one that was so loud that the fans wouldn't even listen to it, and therefore had to be redone, uh, there, there is logic in what he was doing. Were the results good? No, not really. But someone had to try it, and he happened to be Johnny on the spot, or Andrew on the spot, as the case may be. But people took it in their minds, as they had increasingly been doing, well, we can push this harder and harder and harder and harder, and therefore it'll be louder, and people will... So it's not a good thing, because if you come in in a way that you make people unable to take in your thing and enjoy it, they're not going to want to come back. So if you're advertising socks by punching them in the face with, a, with a, a mailed fist with spikes, will they want to buy your socks? No, they associated you, your socks, and pain. There might be a couple of people who like those kinds of socks, but you need a different marketing campaign. If you're selling socks for comfort, then you want to soothe people. Oh, how lovely is this sock? Get my point? So nothing to do with levels, nothing to do with that. It's merely a political thing kind of gone wrong. Should you use it? We'll talk about that later. Now, the next thing is that all of these measures, particularly just dB, because that's the number that we use for everything, they work within scales. So if I say to you, oh, dude, it's like minus 12 dB, what does that mean? Actually nothing until we tie it to a scale. So if we say, oh, this is like showing at minus 12 dB peak, what's well, peaking at minus 12 dB, you'll also hear full scale, but I tend not to use that. It's peaking at minus 12 dB. That tells us that, just like here, this signal is 12 dB from the top of the can in its moment of loudestnessness. Useful information. Therefore, it's not hitting the top of the can, clang. We're not going to get that, and we're not in any danger of that. We can add quite a lot more signal before it starts to get there. Now, we don't hear the clang when it hits the top of the can because I have limited clippers working here in our favour. If somebody says to me, oh, that's minus 12 dB VU, or RMS, we're going to use those terms interchangeably, then we know that we have a different result. We 
we've got that. Now, while it sounds the same to you, see those two numbers are quite different. I'm going to put this back into combined meters now because this is how you should work. If you're working in peak only, stop it. Move into peak plus VU or peak plus RMS if that's what they call it in your door. Because while looking at two pieces of information may seem confusing, this is our peaks up here and it's holding for five seconds. You can choose how long they hold. You can choose whether they don't hold at all or choose to hold infinitely. Infinite holding is attractive, but it's really only attractive in one situation if you want to see across the whole song, but you're too lazy to actually wait for the whole song to play because you've gone and bought a pizza in the meantime. You're not really doing the, the mix engineer's job particularly properly. Your call. Uh, but we've got these meters, and this one shows us, okay, in momentary time, we get up to as little as minus one peak. But the listener is hearing this minus 12 VU. That's what they're hearing or feeling. That's what they're going to report to you if they were capable of reporting numbers. Therefore, we are uh, still within the realms of comfortable. So having these scales tells us what our numbers are telling us. And remember, these numbers don't tell us whether people are going to like your song or not. There's far more to it than that. See people constantly typing in, oh, what numbers do I need to be to, to make hits? Um, you're in the wrong damn direction, Sonny Jim, um, or Mistress Mary. It's a wrong question. You need to be in the job of pleasing people. Remember, if you want them to buy your comfortable socks, oh, aren't they comfortable and lovely? You've got to soothe them. If you want to sell to the four sadomasochistic goths, then, yeah, by all means, get a mailed fist with spikes and punch them in the face. They, they're down with that. But that's not a broad market. You've got to know who your buyer is. This is your job, not numbers. Right, so that's headroom versus feeling. Peak for headroom to know if we're going to hit the top of the can and go clang. And feeling, which is what really matters. How do we want people to feel in this point of time? Do we want them to feel like this blip is overwhelmingly loud, or do we want them to feel like it's a kind of an event? There is a way, if you are at all worried that you're not understanding feeling, and it is difficult, it is a thing you must train yourself to do, to understand feeling, what am I hearing here? Then that is called crest factor. I will strongly encourage first, though, tr either train yourself to understand what you're hearing in terms of feel, which is time consuming. It takes time. It doesn't happen instantly, especially if you have been mistrained. So if you have grown up listening to Death Magnetic, Judas Priest, Firepower, and essentially anything on Spotify for the last 20 years, it's all over loud. So... Just like if you've done nothing but listen to um, to Lady Gargle, Trailer Swift, Ed Sheepman, and you're asked to join a jazz band, what are the chances of you actually playing like a jazz player? Zero, because you have no point of reference for it. You might play random notes out of time and go, oh, but that's jazz, man, thinking that you've got free jazz nailed, but it's not. You've got no background, no training, no understanding in it. In which case, if you're in that position of don't have the ear for it yet, like you haven't trained yourself, then hire somebody who has that understanding. And believe me, that's not some Fiverr Freddy who's saying he'll give you a Grammy winning mix for $15, man. <laughs> it's not going to happen because he's probably uh, 20, 23, has never listened to anything but Lady Gargle. And everything he's ever listened to will be way above. Unless he can show you a deeper understanding, he's not the guy you want. Girl, goat, not being judgy here. This is merely using English in its proper form. So hire somebody who is going to do this right for you. Otherwise, you send your stuff out with completely the wrong message to the people you're trying to get across to. Music is about communication. If you send the wrong message like that, 
fist where you're trying to sell people comfortable socks, you're going to be confused as to why it comes back wrong, like why the feedback is wrong. So hire somebody, train yourself. If you're unwilling to do either of those things, I do worry for your future in the business. But there is crest factor. I've spoken about crest factor before. Now you can see crest factor happening here. And let me give you an example. This is something I prepared earlier. It's actually an excerpt from a track of mine. This is the fully loud dude bit. Let's look at the numbers we get. We've got, that's me, essentially zero VU. This is reading a little slowly, but it's similar to the peaks up here of around minus one, minus two. This has got what's called ballistics, so it takes time for the needle to move. Uh, so it's, but it's, it's, it's good enough to work with, but in pure hard terms, we've got that minus one, minus two. There's actually a smaller headroom there than that, but mm, yes, this sounds a little, a little splatty, but notice how loud it feels. Without reading ridiculously loud numbers, because again, there's a lot of illusion in there. You might be going, but Peg, it's a bit distorted. Yes, it is. You notice the distortion, particularly here, because you've got no reference before where it's where the mix is not particularly distorted but as everything ramps in it starts to distort a little bit to tell people this is actually over loud without actually being over loud this whole thing of going oh well yeah i know that rms should be and in my case minus 12 db because i'm just going to use the peak scale but I, I want to make it louder, so I'm going to push it harder, which is this. But does that sound any better? I'm going to go with a resounding no, it sounds an awful lot worse. Because even though we don't particularly hear more distortion, we've now got a horribly, horribly flattened kind of... Ugh, there's no room to move inside there. We don't have any what's called dynamics. Dynamics is the difference between the peak and the what we perceive. So those extra little spikes are dynamics. And when we crush those unduly, we create a certain feeling, and that can be a useful feeling. There are moments, definitely in a metal record, where we want people to feel, oh, but the problem is, if we feel that way for more than really a few seconds, we make the person uncomfortable. And if that's what we aim to do, more power to you. Horror movies are designed to re 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 make people feel uncomfortable. But uh, something that's just uncomfortable for a long period of time is, guess what? Just uncomfortable. We're, we're back to bashing people in the face in an attempt to sell comfortable socks. It's, it's a disconnect. So we really need to be super careful. Now if we look again, we've got our peaks somewhere around 0 dB without hitting the top of the can. And our RMS, or average, our VU, is around minus 12 dB. We now have, and there'll be a picture, a crest factor of about 12 dB. Meaning 12 dB difference between the peaks and what people are perceiving as fully loud dude. And note that... This is reading as, oh, that's annoying, essentially zero dB, as in, that's loud. That's, that's as loud as we want to hear it on the VU scale. Because I work on a zero dB VU being minus 12. That's what reason works on, and to me it makes perfect sense. Um, others work on minus 18, and that's fine. But despite they're going on about minus 18, they're still trying to deliver dynamic ranges which can be as little as 2 dB. Notice how as I turned that up it just sounded worse and it wasn't because it's a bad mix. The mix is fine. It does what it's meant to do. Whether you like the music that's, that's completely by the by. Um, it's simply because we're crushing that. So the poor listener, like when I try to listen to Judas Priest's Firepower, the poor listener feels like they're being bulldozed. And you might go, but that's great. Now they feel like I'm, I'm in control of them. 
yeah, remember for a few seconds that might be cool. The bit where they go, that's, that's a good moment to make people feel like, oh. But by the time you've been bulldozing somebody for a couple of minutes, not giving them any space to breathe, that is like trash compactoring them, just putting them in a little room and squeezing them. How many people want to be in that situation? Not as many as you think. Uh, there may be genres of music which are all about making people feel uncomfortable, uncomfortable core, or whatever. Um, but the reality is, chances are, your music is not in that space. So don't do it. Create that space and make sure that space is left. There will be times where you might go, you know what? This just feels too much. In which case you might do this. Yeah, I know I'm peaking at, at minus three on the VU, and I've got minus four on the peak, but it feels right. This is important. This is how it's done. I have been quite surprised where I have taken some famous records that are just like, wow. Put them into the door, looked at the metering and gone, thinking that it's going to be like pinning the meters because it's that grand and dramatic. And there's a huge amount of wasted space. So it's never about the numbers. It's not about saying I've got to get those numbers as hard as I can before it sounds too terrible for anybody to want to listen to it. That's, that's just means that you don't have confidence in your material and your material was wrong in the first place. These records that are just bombastic and huge and sound amazing, it's nothing to do with the levels. It's all to do with the confidence, the courage, the, the songwriting, the arrangements, the performances, and then the mix engineer understanding what we might call light and shade. Just as I have used in those stickmen pictures, pictures of match stickmen, uh, to give you illusion of changes in height and position, the mix engineer uses various factors to create the illusion of in front, behind, left and right, of bright and dark, and quiet and fully loud. Even though, in reality, the numbers may not seem quite the same as what you think you're hearing. Remember, music, recorded music, is all illusion. There's no one there. We just get, our job is to train people to hear what we want them to hear. More importantly, to feel what we want them to feel. If it's a slow weepy, we want them to feel like they want to cry with us and feel good about it. If it is death metal, yeah, we might be right up in them, but not all the time. We've got to back off. Otherwise, the constant like, that's not comfortable. We're like, ew, this is icky. So you have to have that movement. And a great record tends to have an awful lot move, more movement than you think. We will also talk about gain staging. Gain staging has been this thing that suddenly, I don't know who started it, but suddenly everyone was like, gain stage, you have to gain stage. As though they knew what they were talking about. Staging, let's separate this out. Staging. If we go to see a band, let's say it's Iron Maiden, because we should all go see Iron Maiden. Uh, because they're masters of what they do. If you haven't, find Flight 666, the, the concert video, and watch it. Because that's how you do that. Doesn't matter whether you dig the genre or not, that's how you do that. Now, how would it be if Iron Maiden walked out onto stage, there was no drum kit, there were no guitars, there were no backdrops of skeletons with flesh falling off them. How would we feel in the audience? Well, it would all be pretty darn silly, wouldn't it? So staging is where we make sure there's a drum kit on the stage where Nico needs it. That there is a guitar standing there where Dave's going to come out and another couple for Adrian and Yannick. Uh, and that there's a bass for Steve and a speaker wedge for him to put his foot up on and go... So when they come out, there's a... and Eddie drops down from behind... This is staging. Staging is getting things ready for what's going to happen. 
because Iron Maiden are going to come on stage and go, and we'll be off. Gain is merely setting a level. There's no reference for gain. Gain merely is the process of turning something up or down. It commonly used to be called trim, because it makes sense to call it trim. Let's trim the level. But now it's always called gain. Fair enough. On the top of any decent mixer, there should be a knob called gain before there's anything else. And notice most doors don't have that. That is just stupid. If your door is one of those ones that doesn't have it, then you get a gain plugin. This is a rack extension, but they, most doors should come with some kind of gain or amplifier plugin, and then you can levelify. You have seen me do that already here. Gain staging in mixing terms is an older thing that's not 100% necessary now, but it makes sense. If you get a mix in, and most of you tend to be mixing as you're going, which is okay, but sometimes mean you can totally miss the point of what you're doing. Um, I've, I commonly mix as I go with my personal music, but there would be times where I've separated, even gone so far as to, to export multi-tracks or stems, I use the terms interchangeably, it's fair. Uh, then put them either into the same door or into another door, and you know what, the mix I've come out with has been different. Sometimes it's been like, yeah, that's not as good because we're just, you know, we're turning the wheel pointlessly. Other times it's shown me something that I wasn't thinking of before because I was wrapped up in what I had rather than stepping back and going, that's what I've really got. So when you get a mix in, then especially if you're getting that from somebody less than seasoned, when you pull everything up, you press play, you may well find that most of the signals coming in, like your drums, could already be peaking at zero or even plus so many dB. That's amateur, but it will happen. In which case, when that happened, when you got your, your, your multi-tracks in, you, you pressed play and everything was just like stupid loud, then you would go across the top of the mixing board, twiddle, 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 or the gain or trim knob on the top of each channel, and bring it down so that each channel was reading whatever number you set. Being reason and being me, I would set it so that each channel looked like it was giving me minus 12. And that's great. Reason, uh, their, um, their track VUs, these ones here, are actually VUs. Some people don't like that. They only want to see peak here, but these are actually VUs because VU makes more sense than peak. Peak is only necessary on the masters to make sure you're not hitting the top of the can. So with everything at, let's say minus 12, when we put two signals together, or well, our first signal that comes in, the masters will be reading minus 12. Peak, brilliant, we're safe. We put our second thing in, so our drums, we put our bass in, we've now added up to 6 dB. Let's go with 6 dB because it's 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 a practical number, seeing we have to pick something. It can be anywhere from 0 to, to 6 dB because sound is complex, but let's say 6 dB. So every time we add a second sound, we double up. So if we're at minus 12, we're now at minus 6 with two things in the mix. Add another one, we're actually at 0 dB. By the time we've got the Beatles in with four instruments, that's including a singer, because one of them is not allowed to play guitar anymore, because that would just be too much, then we're actually at plus six. Now, the problem there is that if people come in and they've got at all their instruments individually at or above zero dB, as soon as they've added the second one, they're significantly above. So if you've got four things in, you're at 12, 24 dB, plus 24 dB. That is not going to go away. And you see people then getting their master fader and pulling it down and they get to the end of their mix and their master fader's got a throw of about two millimeters. That is wrong, seriously, seriously wrong because you can't make proper mix decisions in the mix and you've got nowhere to go. So gain staging simply means at the beginning of the mix process, making sure that you don't have stupid levels 
for the material that's there. And while there's a rule of minus 12 or whatever given, that's not a rule, that's just a don't have a stupid level. If I've got a sound effect, let's say it's frogs chirping, I'm not wanting that coming into the mix at uh, minus 12 dB at all because it's going to be too loud. So I might see that and have that come up and, and it might be at, um, I don't know, it might be at minus 60 and still be right. I'm not going to pump that up to minus 12 because I'm then going to have to undo it when it comes to. So gain staging merely means being practical. Here's another example. Let's say, and I just got this as a birthday present, I had this a long, long time ago and went stupid and sold a crate of, um, of records and CDs. Never do that. And I let go of this. This is a charming record. Let's say Mr. Diamond comes into the studio and let's say that he has his guitar and he plugs it into the mega metal pedal that's been left on the floor ready for his Ilan performance. Starts playing and ooh, doesn't sound very metal at all. It doesn't even sound like blues, it just sounds pathetic and weedy. Mix engineer comes out, takes a look around, and then realises that Mr. Diamond actually forgot to turn the volume knob on his guitar up. And he goes, oh, Mr. Diamond, oh, Mr. Diamond. Turns it up to full, because that's where all men should have it, and to be medley. Kerrang! And we're back in the realms of... Evil. That's gain staging as well. It's simply because the mega metal pedal can't make diamond sound kingly if it doesn't have enough level in the first place. So you simply need to be aware of what you're going to be jamming into next. And that's all it means. What comes next? Be prepared for it. If you're going to be wanting to use the mega metal pedal, but to tickle it very, very lightly, because let's say you're expecting King Diamond, but Eric Clapton walks in and you're like, oh, I don't have time to change the pedal. Then you're simply going to go, okay, we, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> and even if Eric wants to turn his knob fully up, then you might put a little box in between that sheds an awful lot of level before his guitar hits the mega metal pedal. And he might go, hmm, that's, that's, that's a little different from my usual blues tone, but, but you know what? I, I like that. I'll go with that. Phew, done. That's staging. We've just got stuff ready for what comes next. Now, here's an example. We've got a big picture. We've got levels, which are represented by matchstick men again. And as you see, they go through one little retro wave process after another. You know they're retro wave because they're pink and purple. But well, we've got a problem. As they're about to go into the Masters, we see that our little man is far too big to fit into the box. Now, I know that most of you, you're going to go, oh, but we crush him. We use limiters. We use clippers. We use insert favorite stupid plug in here. No, that's not gain staging. Gain staging is where we simply say, as we've already covered, you take that level and you change it. So we would get our little levelator, as you saw me do here. And we go, that's the right amount for what comes next. That's the right amount for listeners. It's definitely the right amount for this listener with these headphones in this situation. There are no hard and fast rules. And all this rubbish that you see posted by people who do not know what they're doing about Game staging and rules. You must be this all the time. It's like, it's like, you don't know what you're doing. Go do what you know what you're doing and leave other people alone. Don't go there. It's merely about making sure the signal's ready for what comes next. If you want that to hit the next process hard, brilliant. Wind it up. If you want it to back off, like we had with Eric Clapton stuck with our mega metal pedal, then pull it back. If you have to drop it by, you know, 48 dB, which we might have to with Eric's guitar and that mega metal pedal, that's what you do. There are no rules. It's about what gets the job done. And what gets the job done is feeling. Does this feel right? See, note when Eric was presented with a different tone that that's coming out of the mega metal pedal, Rather than going, but that's not the way you, that's not the right sound. He just goes, hmm, that's different, but you know what? That's kind of cool. I'm going to work with that. And puts out his record, and it's good. Why? Because it's Eric Clapton. 
and he knows what he's doing and he's worked with what he's got. That's what we need to be doing. Now, we'll look a little bit more at LUFS. I said we were going to talk about that. So this is why I think LUFS and the whole streaming service leveling thing do not matter. Firstly, the issues that LUFS was trying to solve were nothing to do with sound. They were to do with poor production, poor decision making. Fair enough, sooner or later we were going to try it. You know, we, we got the bomb and, and we had nuclear proliferation. Then we realised it was all a little silly and pointless and we started to work on nuclear deproliferation. LUFS is the equivalent of nuclear deproliferation, nuclear disarms and all that kind of stuff. It's merely trying to roll back a, a problem that we created. It's an inevitable problem that we would have created that people started to realise, oh, with this digital stuff we can get louder and louder and louder. And, and that they abused that. Rather than using it, they abused it. And they've created decades of music and what have you, films that are unenjoyable because they're just too effing loud to be comfortable because they've forgotten the merits of VU, or more importantly, the merits of is this enjoyable? So understandably, some people put their heads together and said, OK, well, if they can't control themselves, if they're just going to dribble into their uh, into their underpants all day, then we need to control their incontinence for them and set a set of rules and standards. Now, these rules and standards were set way back when AM radio, definitely by the 60s, if not well before, was pretty even. I listened to FM radio through the 80s, definitely through the 90s, uh, and levels were pretty even. And this was done in part by levelling compressors and or limiters. That's what they were invented for, program compressors, levellers. That's what they were invented for, things that now kind of look like this fine fella. That's what they were designed for. Uh, and they do a good job, but more importantly, the DJ and or producer, because shows had a producer who was somebody sitting there with the faders and making sure that everything happened, uh, they uh, simply used their ears. Ooh, that's a bit much, and pulled it back. And if they knew that um, Satan's sock service had a, an advert that was running at, you know, plus 18 dB, assuming that was doable at the time, they just would mark that on the cartridge so that when they pushed it in, it had a little sign, minus 18 dB. So they would set their fader to minus 18 dB so that when Satan's sock service advert comes on, it feels like a pretty decent flow with uh, the, the, the local Presbyterian church fair. It feels even. And this was done by the 60s, definitely done all the way through the 80s, Television were not so well mannered. It was quite common for ads to come on for Ugh, chips, um, but it wasn't too terrible. It was just annoying because the programs were made at the right level and adverts were made aggressively. But that was simply the the politics of payment, as in the uh, the chip advertiser said, "Well, I'm not going to pay you money if you don't make my ad louder." That's nothing to do with technology, technique, anything to do with that. It was simply the politics of payment, much as has happened with the steaming services like Netflix and Spotify and what have you. But collectively, they said, let's solve this problem because it was a problem. And so they, they created the new VU and they called it LUFS because new numbers people get excited by. If they'd simply used existing numbers, people would have been like, we know what we're doing because we're already fudging them. So in terms of was it necessary? Not at all. It's trying to solve a problem that's not solved with numbers. Its solution lies in actually training mix engineers rather than letting them go out there and do dumb things in the, in the attempt to beat the system and well, get beaten themselves in reality. Uh, the other question is like, oh, but, 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 but you know, I, I don't want to lose level. Okay, let's look at this a couple of ways. The first way is, if you are louder than you should be, do you want your product, your song, to be associated with making people feel uncomfortable? Probably not. So if you are Satan's sock service, really wanting people to buy your comfy socks, 
do you want to make them spit their soup up every time they see your advert? No, no, you do not. So having the service turn your ad down that 18 dB so that it's as comfortable as um, the Presbyterian Church's fate, they've done you a favor. So that people go, ooh, socks, in a positive kind of association. They've done you a favor. If your levels are coming in wrong, too loud, turning you down is exactly what you hope that they would do to fix your incompetence. If you're a little quiet, and you've you're not quite gotten in the game, then the service will simply raise it, as DJs would if they felt like even the beginning of a song was a bit too quiet, the bit where do 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 before they start singing about stairways to heaven, they will ride that. So the, the, the engineer or producer would simply be like, yeah, okay. And he may even have notes on the front of it that's like, come in at plus six, pull back at this point. When he goes, then you pull back. This is how it was done. Um, we now got bots that kind of do this for us. They don't do it as intelligently as humans did, but it's still evened out. So if they're keeping you in the game, that's a bonus. This is good. I have no problems with a standard. That it's laughs, yeah, whatever. But the, the new numbers don't change the way the human brain and emotions work. The next one, and this is the far more worrying one, where people go, oh, but if my mix loses 1.5 dB, then my music will sound like pathetic, dude. Well, maybe you need to face the fact that your music already doesn't work very well. If you think that adding another 37 dB on the front end is going to make it sound any better, remember as I pushed this up, Let's go again. Like, this sounds really good in my cans here. This sounds unpleasant. So is pushing your mix any harder actually going to make it any better? No, not at all. So losing 1.5 dB is not going to ruin your song. Matter of fact, we can hear here, it actually eases things, at least here. Because this section is over loud. It's meant to be. It's the crescendo of the piece. It makes sense in the context of the whole piece, but on its own, it's just like, ugh, it's a bit brutal. It's a bit bulldozery. So you, you need to make sure that your piece is written well, arranged well, performed well, and then mixed appropriately, understanding how to build those illusions rather than just going, if I throw more level at this, then I'll be good. If you lose level and you think your song loses goodness, then there is something wrong, at least with your mix. So this whole sort of thing about, oh, but, but, but they're going to turn me down. What do you care? You shouldn't care. If you care, it tells me there's something wrong with the mix. I know you don't want to hear that, but... If we keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again, like if we keep punching our wife in the face saying, here, buy these socks, they're super comfortable. I wonder why we make no sales, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's not the fault of the socks. It's the fault of the process. So make sure, A, that the socks are comfy, that you can get them on your customer's feet. I know I said wife before, but your customer's feet. Or... If you can't get them on your customer's feet because they're in some bedroom on the other side of the world, then at least use other people who can give testimonial. Oh, these are the most comfortable socks I've ever, I've ever worn. Thank you, Satan. You've saved my life. That's what we need to do. We need to give people the experience that they want. And if your experience is not working, if it's broken for some reason, then accept that because now it means you can work out how to make your process right. And it's not through making things louder. So if you think that losing some level somewhere is going to make your piece fail, then your piece doesn't translate in the first place. Remember, mixing is never about it hitting technical targets. Yes, we want to make sure that we don't hit the top of the can and go clang, but it's not about meeting technical targets, about meeting emotional targets. So when I listen to records, whether it's this or um, record that I will never ever let go of for anybody or anything, 
my wife says to me, oh, it's, it's you or Alan Parsons, you can go, dear, you can go. I'm not letting go of Alan Parsons for anything or anybody. Why? Because his records are so damn good at any volume. So we can take Alan Parsons' Eye in the Sky or Roxy Music's Avalon, which is beautifully mixed, even though there is quite a lot of compression going on in there, uh, and put it at any reasonable, sane sort of volume, and the song still works. That's mixing. If you are, let's say like me, making more diffuse space music, I simply know that it's not going to translate everywhere. I know that my music will not translate on, on a little tinny tranny, you know, the little plastic transistor radio, um, AM radio, uh, with at best a two-inch paper cone. Somebody trying to listen to a lot of my music, especially if they're driving a tractor at the same time, is not going to translate. That's simply the case. If my target audience is tractor drivers, then I need to switch to country music because that's the kind of thing that can translate in that format. If I try to change the world that all tractor drivers must listen to space music while and their tractors, I'm probably pushing a certain amount of stuff up hill. So it doesn't matter. This Luffs thing, whatever, use the numbers if they amuse you. But there's a trans direct translation between Luffs and VU or close enough. If you're using the um, uh, crest factors that I've indicated, which is what you see on screen of peaking just under zero and your VU sitting at or around 12. It's possible to go louder, but I didn't mean to here. Some mixes I'll go up there with the numbers, but in this case it's loud enough already through all of the other stuff that I'm doing that it just sounds terrible to push harder, but that 12 dB crest factor peak at about zero, RMS or, or VU at about minus 12, you're probably in about the right place. If you're listening to it that way and going, it just feels a bit too much as I did in this case, then you pull it back a little bit. If you're thinking it only sounds good when you do this, then your mix is broken. Find out what's going on. If necessary, rather than just going, oh, well, I'll watch more tuts from some idiot who's gonna give you the wrong advice, find a skilled mix engineer, preferably an older one, somebody who has decades of experience, preferably from before Spotify, where everything is over loud, uh, and learn from them, pay them, sit with them, discuss with them. Don't treat them like they're your servant. They're the master. Absorb from them. If you aren't willing to do that, there are good interviews or things where you can watch people mix. Not idiots mixing EDM who have never had a, a release of any merit whatsoever. Um, what, watch things. Andrew Sheps, he knows what he's doing. I, I like the guy. CLA, what I like about CLA is his, <laughs> his, his cut and thrust, his enthusiasm, his, he throws himself at things. I don't love him as a mix engineer, but that, that side is good. Um, you still see that everything's done by feel. Um, 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 Bob Clear Mountain. Um, 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 uh, what's his name who did uh, uh, Nevermind? Um, not exactly ex an exciting interview. <laughs> Where's his overalls and it's just like... But he knows what he's doing. He's a, he's a really good mix engineer. Watch these kinds of people. Um, producer, I know he doesn't, he never talks about mixing, but Rick Rubin. Watch people like this. You're not looking to see where did they put the knob, because where they put the knob's irrelevant. Look to understand how they express feeling. And CLA, a lot of the material that he's working with is, so he is very in the way he mixes it. And that's appropriate. He's trying to get across that feel um, and often trying to make very flat emo kind of <laughs> not particularly excitingly developed material come across as exciting. So he throws it at the wall. And fair enough, because he's doing that for the emotive reaction that he wants people to have. And people listen to these emo bands and go, oh, how exciting is that? I think how boring is that, but that's because I'm able to see straight past the illusion he's trying to give. 
and good on him, he's doing his job. That's if you are only going to watch YouTube, watch people like that. And of course, probably myself, even though I'm breaking a lot of what you think I should be saying. But understand, there's a reason why I'm saying this. And if you look, I've got a, a pretty decent catalog. Um, and if you are in needing of this, um, one of my clients is currently touring and actually playing in the Wiggles band. Yeah, I'm not a big Wiggles fan. I don't exactly get spend my time putting on Wiggles records, especially not when I got Alan Parsons and King Diamond. Uh, but there, there are few acts who are as good at what they do as the Wiggles. In terms of dollars, they, they might even eclipse Iron Maiden. Um, we had that discussion about, you know, which which would be better going out on tour and playing in uh, in the Wiggles or Iron Maiden. And, and we kind of landed on the fact that there was no shame in the Wiggles at all. It's up there with the Bee Gees. So this is the, the kind of approach, the kind of people that I work with. Um, again, I am blowing my trumpet, but it's deliberate to try to 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 counter that part of you that will be trying to say, oh, but but who are you? What do you know about anything? Um, and that, well, I've heard of Adele, therefore she must be great. Personal choice and what's good are not always the same. I like quite a lot of bands that aren't necessarily good. I mean, God, people like the Ramones, people like Kiss. I think Kiss are great, but are they good? No, <laughs> but they're great. They're fun. They're entertainers. Same with the Ramones. Were they Mozart? <laughs> I don't think so. But they're great. So it's about, you know, what you like and what is cool and what is good, not always being 100% the same. That's really all the, the final words there. Uh, the conclusion here, of course, is I hope that you have found value in this. Again, please, if you've got this far, read the written, watch this, even go over again, there are some pretty complex concepts in here that are outside of that straight ahead approach that most people try and use and of course fail with. Remember, music, all illusion. And our job is to stage things, like I put those little matchstick men up, in such a way that people feel the illusion that we are creating. And meters give us a little bit of an indicator of what's going on but our hearts are what give us the real indication of what's going on. If you have any questions, now please, questions, don't just be the, I've had a couple of them over the last couple of videos, people who want to write just basically condescending things. Um, not cool. You merely make yourselves look stupid in public. Um, here we have a policy more of removing things, uh, but I personally have a policy these days of where people are very, very rude to me. I will often take that and uh, expose it elsewhere. Uh, and a couple of people have found themselves put in the public spotlight for things they have done. If you want to take me on personally, professionally in public, I will take you on. And unless you are somebody of merit, expect to be buried. If you were someone of merit, you wouldn't be taking me on the way you are. This is super important. So if you have broad questions, you want to engage positively, hit subscribe, fire on down below. And of course, hirehertz.com, where the written version of this, hopefully there is going to be a direct link to the article. Uh, and there's another stream of information there as well. Most importantly, go out, try, experience these things, and have a great day.